Hey everyone, welcome to episode 39. My name is Kay Shivan, I'm the producer. Today's episode is with Alex McDonald, who is a 2019 Dalhousie graduate, as well as a 2019 University of Toronto GDIP graduate. Alex currently works at New Look Capital, which is a private equity firm based in Burlington, Ontario. And he joined Sam to discuss his journey from graduating at Dalhousie, where he was taught by Sam, to now his current role at New Look Capital. Um, Alex spent some time at Grant Thornton and as well wrote the CFI, which uh, he ultimately didn't pass on day one. And he shared his his lessons and his thoughts on why that happened and, and how to overcome obstacles that you experienced throughout the CPA process. Uh, I've linked Alex's uh, LinkedIn in the description. Feel free to check it out and uh, reach out to him and connect with him if you'd like uh, and enjoy the episode. All right. Hello, Alex McDonald. How's it going? Good. How are you today, Sam? I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I was laughing because right before we got on here, you called I uh, just like being in my classroom, the good old days. So I'd like you to say it a little louder for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Sam was definitely the most energetic teacher I had and made all the classes very fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, like who isn't excited <laughs> to be there at 8.30 on a Monday morning, right? <laughs> exactly. Nothing gets me going like accounting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I just can't wait till the weekend's over so we can go to class on Monday. Yeah, no, you were part of my uh, my OG group. So mm-hmm. um, always, always super excited to, to catch up and what's better to do this than in front of our classroom in our guest speaker series. But before I get into this, I'm going to ask the hard hitting intro question. Sure which thing. is, if you were an Olympian, which sport would you be competing in? And it can be a real, or you can make up your own sport. Like, there, there's no rules here. I would say discus. Go on. Just because, like, I feel like that, so I play a bunch of ultimate frisbee, and I feel like that's the closest comparable sport. I like that. Yeah, so, interesting. Oh, and it's, like, a unique one. That or diving. I love it. I feel like that is kind of encapsulates a lot of our year together um, in the sense that, you know, uh, I never knew what exactly, what kind of answer I would get from you, which I appreciate, <laughs> right? It's diverse, yeah. diverse interests, diverse skills. Do you yeah, remember? Definitely polar opposites. Yeah. In yeah, terms yeah. of Olympian ability. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Um, do you remember the assignment that you had um, that you made the YouTube video for? I do not. Oh my gosh. Okay. Maybe I'll start talking and if you you save me a little bit, but I believe it was um, for your history class or some sort of history. Oh yes. I was like a counting one. I do remember this one. Yeah. It was a history rap about Pier 21. Yeah. So sorry. uh, History rap battle. Yes. So I did a rap about the history of Pier 21 in Halifax. It was for, I think, Halifax in the world class. Love it. So yeah. it's like, you come to our class, um, you contribute, you have a good attitude, you do well, and you all are also, <laughs> you know, killing it and making rap battles for your history <laughs> class and creative, right? So yeah. when people kind of, I don't know, bring your, bring your true self to class and you'll, you'll find a home. For sure. Okay, so that's kind of what leads us into the first question, which is how do we know each other? Um, I was your prof uh, yep. a number of years ago. You graduated in 2019. That is correct. Yeah. And I guess we stayed in touch a little, hey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been catching up, like, I'd say once every six months or so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I absolutely uh, look forward to. And so in between you graduating Adele and us sitting here right now, um, May of 2022, um, how, like, tell me a bit about your path to becoming a designated accountant, because spoiler alert, you are a CPA now, or you're, or, or you are past the CP and you're working on your final months in the paperwork. I have all my hours. I just need to do the part. I've just been delaying that. But yes, I'm very close to being a CPA. Okay. Okay. Um, so essentially, when I graduated, I just started full time working for Grant Thorn, which is where I did all my uh, co ops with at Dalhousie. Oh, and, and did you do Grant Thornton in Toronto or did you do Grant Thornton in Halifax? In Toronto. So okay, I so, went away for all my co-ops. Oh, okay, perfect. And then or back so home, you, as I should say. Okay, so then when you graduated, you went back and that's and then started full time at Grand Thornton. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the audit group. But before I started full time, I did do the GDIP at U of T. So the graduate, graduate diploma in professional accounting. Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, you went right from graduating in like, you know, ending in April of 2019 and then starting right away in mm -hmm. um, U of T. And how was that? Because, you know, I feel like I wasn't very useful um, to our 2019 grads. So they'd be like, how, how's the GDIP program? And I was like, I don't know. And I'm like, I'll, I'll find <laughs> I'll find some people. I'll like you tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, yeah. and then come back and tell me about it, so I can tell our future students. Sorry. Yeah, it was good. It was a great experience. I feel like the year after me would have had a tough time with it being remote, but like definitely the year I did it, it was non-remote, and it was like a great experience to be able to go through and learn all the tax, all the stuff um, related to the CPA before like having to do the modules or like having it all segregated, just having it like essentially squeezed into a very small time period where you're able to just like power through and get it done. Yeah. Um, and so how was it? Because you would have gone, there would have been, I think like three or four other Dell people there. I'll, actually, mm -hmm. I think most of them have been on the podcast. So Zach and Stephanie um, have been yep. on a few years ago. And then our, our person, Mackenzie, uh, was also yep. there with you. And there's likely a bunch of other U of T students there. Would that be oh, correct? So many U of T students. Yeah. So, and, you know, feel free to say pass at any time for any of these questions. Um, or as you know, like, welcome to, yeah, move along. But how did you, was it ever a thought like, oh, there's all these U of T people here. Um, how are we going to, you know, you know, navigate with all of like, do they have an advantage? Um, what were your thoughts going in? And then what were your thoughts after the first week or two? And did they change? Um, so I was pretty carefree, I would say, going in. I wasn't necessarily too concerned. Like the UFT students were very friendly and like never at once made me feel unwelcome. Like there were definitely yeah. like pre-existing friendships and stuff. But like I also knew a few of the UFT students from my co-op at Grant Thornton. Right. So like the, it wasn't like I was completely out of the blue um but then yeah so like in terms of preparation i would say the thing that prepared us most was um tammy's course yeah yeah Just the like, case course yeah exactly so having case experience and like knowing how to write it so like when the i made a few friends with the same effect students who were there yeah and they told us that they hadn't had any case writing experience so they had to catch up fairly quickly and like that would have definitely made it a lot tougher but I, overall, like, I would say I was well prepared for the U of T course. And yeah. honestly, I saved all the PowerPoints and I still use them today. Like when I was like forgetting about a bunch of tax concepts, I had to quickly open up the PowerPoints again. Oh, yeah. No, um, resources are like gold. So when you find one that clicks with you, like, yeah, keep them. Um, that mm -hmm. goes the same for undergraduate, graduate, or you just go to a conference and you're like, oh, this is this this really resonates with me, save it. And you never know when it might come back and when you might be able to share it with somebody else. Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay. So then you were at U of T, you did your G dip. And I feel like it ends like a little bit, um, like end of July or beginning of August. Yeah. It's only three months. Okay. And then you um, start back at GT in October? Uh, September, I think. September, September around like 15th. So okay. right, by the, right around the CP. Like not the CPE the year I wrote, yeah. but like one year in advance. Gotcha. Okay. Um. So then, did you go on vacation, or did you prep for your new new job? Like I, I always ask because, like, I couldn't afford to go on vacations. I couldn't afford to do anything like that when I was a mm -hmm. student. So I would have worked, um, or worked less or worked more, um, depending. But what did you get up to? I did absolutely nothing. I <laughs> was it lovely. I think I went out to the on vacation to my family or my cousin's cottage, and that's out in Lake of the Woods in Manitoba. Okay. So it's a 24 hour drive, a little bit of a trek. Yeah, definitely got some like distance before you started back at work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And okay. just relaxed, essentially. <sighs> yeah, definitely good. So then you work at GT and when you come back, are you an experienced associate at this time because of your co-ops or how did yeah, that work? Yeah, so I came back as an intermediate because I had one year of experience and one busy season. 
Yeah. Okay. So then bring me through all the way up into the CP. So um, essentially I took a year or like I worked through the year, worked through the busy season. It was like, honestly, I found as like the intermediate busy season was not too bad, but then uh, with the senior busy season and COVID things just got a lot worse. But yeah, so my first intermediate busy season was when COVID actually started hitting or halfway through. And so like, I would say it definitely changed the dynamic because like you started working remotely and like at GT, they put a bunch of people into like different plans on like how many hours a week you should be working. And like, um, essentially they put like people who like were more in the support network onto like less hours. So it was definitely weird sort of figuring out the your role with that. Yeah. And like definitely a tough change to accommodate during busy season. Yeah. 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 No, so it was like a good I would say because of that, I was able to like it was a good busy season. There wasn't too much to do, but like also like a lot of the clients were very understanding if deadlines were later because of COVID and like all the stuff going on. Yeah. Fortunately the clients yours um the government for some of the personal tax and the corporate tax um Mm -hmm. as well as were the exchanges did they give any kind of extensions or like could you apply for any extensions i'm pretty sure they like you can apply but like there were also like fees related to that so a lot of the clients didn't want to yeah yeah Good to know. So we're going to fast forward and then we're going to go back because linear is overdone. Uh, I see that as, you know, a 35 year old doing her doctorate, uh, you know, (laughs) why, why wait? Um, Why, or why wait, but also, you know, you're never too old, you know, blah, blah, blah. So linear is overdone. Where are you now? Are you still a GT? I am not a GT. I'm now at a private investment firm located in Burlington, Ontario. Okay, so how did you get from GT to there? Um, I essentially around like, uh, or the past summer, I was reached out to by like one of my old managers asking me if I wanted to go work for um, him at Manulife. But then, or no, not Manulife, Allstate. Mm-hmm. So another one of the insurance companies. Um, and then around halfway or th- on my third interview with them, um, he men- mentioned that he n- now got a better job at another insurance company and was leaving this one. And I was like, that, the main reason I'm going to Allstate was to work with him because he was a good manager that I liked working with. And I always find that like the people are what make the job rather than the like job itself. Absolutely. So I didn't continue going through the interview process and I started just looking elsewhere casually. And so I like come around October I was like I really don't want to do another busy season in audit especially with how many people are leaving and how crazy the deadlines are going to be with fewer staff and essentially that so I was like yeah let's just look keep looking and try and find a good people to work with and that's how I I was essentially just going through recruiters kept sending them my resumes and doing interviews I found that like interview practice was really important. So I took whatever interviews I could get just to improve my interviewing skills. I think that's so underrated and something that really hasn't come up in our podcast uh, very often. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. Practice Mm -hmm. makes perfect. And you're very unlikely to make the same quote mistake. And after a while you're like, Oh, I heard that question before. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, where you stepped wrong in the past and you can avoid those misstatements in the future with a lot of practice. And so essentially from that, I found the company I'm working for now. I was actually between two companies. Um, one was Kingset Capital, so like a large real estate investment um, trust uh, in, located in downtown Toronto. Um, and I think that was actually my number one choice, but I got um, put on a, like, I was between me and another candidate and they were very, like, very much being like if the next job we have you don't have to interview you can just have it they it's just like they went with the other candidate first but they thought I was still like a very good candidate but then I like 
I'm, I would say I'm happy I didn't take that job because I feel like being a downtown investment firm, it would have been very much a bit of the same of what I'd have to deal with at the firms and like the intense deadlines and amount of work. So I ended up going with New Look Capital, which is my, um, the, my current job. I'm a, the senior accountant and essentially what I'm doing is what you taught me in school. So I'm doing the IFRS consolidation of companies. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh wow. That is really, really neat. Oh boy. Okay. I'm scared to ask, but um, how, so not exact totals, but like in general, uh, are there more than two companies that you're consolidating? Um, it's interesting. So I think there's about 15, mm-hmm. but then there's also companies that have restricted assets, which we don't have any ownership over, but we still consolidate them because of our significant influence. Oh my and God. like, we can't physically own those assets. So it's like very complicated in that sense. Oh my gosh. I love that so, so much. Yeah. It's the one that's always like throws people for a loop because we go through, we deal with a whole like, you know, you you own a little bit, you own like a lot of it, then you own like most of it and then you own all of it or I guess all of it and then most of it. And then after we figure out, okay, this is what happens at acquisition. This is what happens after acquisition. Then we kind of, and everybody's like, (laughs) no more, no more. And then we're like, we have these weird things of like, you know, what we have a joint venture. Oh, hey, we have joint operations. Oh, hey, um, we don't have anything that we ever looked at before, but we still have control. What do we do? So that's really cool that you see that in real life. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, do you, um, is it true to say, or fairly representative to say that the same principles to, you know, smush two companies together and remove the excess still apply if you're dealing with 10, 15, 20, et cetera. Like, yes, in like general principles. Yeah. But for essentially each new clinic we acquire, we acquire them during the year and then amalgamate them oh, um, yeah, at, yeah. at year end. So like, yeah. Each clinic has a specific, like, like each is unique. So you definitely can't just apply the same treatment to all of yeah. them. You have to dig deep down and like figure out what actually is going on. How did we structure the transaction? Love it. Like, and a lot of the stuff that like we, we don't necessarily care about at the console level yeah. will come up in the review level. So it's like, you have to make sure you do the accounting correctly, even if it's not going to affect the console. Like, we have a lot of intercompany receivables and stuff that just cancel out. So yeah. like we have to make sure those still work even though they will cancel out. Completely. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, I just know that we had one other uh, person, I think in the year after you, that ended up being in charge of their console for uh, like similar um, real estate uh, investment company. And he, it was like over a hundred companies. And he's like, the, like you said, the underlying principles are still the same. So it's like, yeah, we, we learn one because one is hard enough, but yeah, once you kind of get into the fun, like the fundamentals are the fundamentals. And so mm-hmm. you still need to, but you also have the entity specific um, elements to take care of as well. No, that's really, really neat. Okay. So I just want to, before we move on too, too far, uh, I want to know a little bit about your CPA um, education journey because you did um, GDIP and then you did CPA PEP for Capstone 1, Capstone 2, and then the CP. Yep. Um, and then the would... CP again. And then, hmm? And then the CP again. And then the CP again. How about you uh, tell me a little bit about that? Sure thing. So when I first wrote the CP, I passed day two and three, but not day one. So then the next year I took, a, I think only so the first time I took like the whole recommended time off, like the yeah. month and a half or two months or whatever it is. Yeah. And what did you do and during I, that time? Um, I tried to follow the study guide yeah. to the, pretty much to the T. Yeah. I would say I didn't do as many day one practice cases as I should. But did you do all the, like they, they have one in the module workshop and then one in week three and one in week six. Did you do those? Um, I did, but okay. I would, I like, didn't do them on time so one of them didn't get graded okay and then, but did you debrief them i think honestly i'm yeah. trying to remember back i'm gonna i'm gonna say you did because i i yeah. just i'm pointing this out for people because you know um hindsight is 2020 so you know looking at it in lens i i firmly believe that you did every 
everything that was reasonable. And mm-hmm. now what the advice that you're here in part to give um, to, you know, the people that you're lifting up our Dal alum is like, sure. okay, how do you no, know what I know now? Hmm? The briefing definitely is a key. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do I know, like, you know, maybe put a little bit more emphasis on day one, because uh, as you kind of alluded to, uh, you pass day two and day three, which people tend to say is like the really hard part. Yeah. And then um, we're unsuccessful on day one. So tell mm-hmm. me a bit about, about that. So I actually got it uh, reviewed by Densmore. Um, I got the like PEP thing. The PAR, well. yeah, the performance mm-hmm. assessment report. And so um, when I submitted it to Densmore, they, <laughs> the words that they used were, you are so very close to passing. Uh, essentially I if I had done like I know they so n- not advice for students but had I focused on two of the issues and instead of spreading out like the power the the um points like to address on each of the issues um I believe I would have passed so I was essentially one um bullet point short on three of the issues and so had I like mentioned one more pro or con on like one of those, I would have passed. So I, I just, I want to be very careful just because I, yeah. I do a lot of work at CPA, um, like PEP. And yeah. so feel free to cut the, like any of these. No, 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 out. we won't cut anything out. But like, it's, it's um, one of those things that like reading the, the board reports, possibly if you had taken um, what I, what I interpret that to be is maybe a little bit of your operational items and put it to one of the strategic um, alternatives, yeah. then that would have been, but, but yeah, yeah uh, I forget. I'm not like, no, no, honestly, no, no worries. No worries. I just want to make sure or, went out of my head. or I, like you have the four strategic alternatives. You had just overdone one. And perhaps like if, if one of the other ones had had one more element, then you would have been. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I just want to, I want to bring it up because it's not like and I know this isn't what you were saying, but sometimes we'll be like, oh, there's four SA strategic um, alternatives. And then there's some operational elements. Oh, I just won't do one of the essays. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you have to do them mm-hmm. all. You have maybe, to do them all for sure. Maybe one, just one of the three. And listen, I love that you shared this because I, I failed mod five, which is right before the CP. And the same thing when I like got my transcript analyzed, it was so frustrating because uh, yeah, it was one of like, like three, one more mark, one more pro or con, one more this. And so, and that also being said is not every single pro or con you or I write is going to count because sometimes you just have a bad pro or con. So what was the biggest element that you kind of learned from getting that performance assessment report? Were you, were you frustrated that you were so close? Were you empowered that you were so close? Like what was kind of going through your mind when you first found out? And, and then how did you use it to shape your studies? Um, I would say I almost wish I had fucked up something. Oh, yeah. sorry, not to swear. No, um, no, no, that's like, like one of my favorite swear words. It's all good. There would be like a, like a clear thing I could work yeah. on to improve and pass next time. But it was just that like, I just hadn't like used my time as effectively or like, I think honestly, like I didn't really change too much of what I did for the second time I wrote. I pretty much did the exact same thing and just um, made sure to write a little faster and put more bullet points on every of the strategic alternatives and just hope that that, that would help me pass. Yeah. I mean, what's super cool about that is, <sighs> yeah, if you had like fucked up really big, then it's like, Hey, sweet. I have a big target. To yeah, aim at. exactly. When it's so close, it almost becomes a mental game. Cause it's like, okay, you really shouldn't change very much. Yeah because you were almost there and, but you just need to tweak and tweak and like, and ramp it up. And then for myself writing um, the module exam the second time, like I know going into it, I had all these emotions. I also had a little bit of like bitterness, like I shouldn't be here. Like I was so close. And then like shame, I'm like, Oh, I can't believe I'm here. Like what's mm-hmm. going to go on? What are people thinking? What am I thinking? What's happening? And so it's like the mental game of that rewrite. I find it's kind of where you really get to like, Prove sure. yourself and be like, can I show up when, um, when I don't, I'm angry <laughs> or I'm sad. Yeah. Very fair. Honestly, like, yeah, just the not having a target is difficult. So it's like, I need to make sure I stick to what like the Densmore like guide is, but like, I also don't want to change too much. So like, 
I know it worked for me and just yeah. like trying to fine tune it, I would say. Absolutely. And I'm like, I'm all about continual like performance and tweaking and, you know, I know, know you are as well. And for better or worse, since uh, the year that you wrote, they have been coming out with better and better day one guidance. And so, you know, I'd say my biggest piece of advice to people that are concerned with day one is A, be concerned. Be concerned with day mm-hmm. one, be concerned with day two, be concerned with day three, because you need to pass all three. And yeah. with day one, read the board of examiners report now, because they actually tell you, um, you know, how to integrate your situational analysis. They will tell you more and more about what candidates did well. And not saying that you didn't read it, but it's just, I find um, that they give more information now, which, Mm -hmm. you know. I would say that the worst thing I did on day one, the time I passed is I had five minutes left at the end and I was like feeling very confident about it. So I was like, no, I've written enough points on each of them. I don't need to add any more. I'm good. And I would say, just make sure you're using your time up to the very end. Like don't, take those last five minutes for granted like you're better safe than sorry Alex I did the same thing yeah I did the same thing and I would now yeah you use the time right but the good thing is is like lots of people experience lessons but not a not everybody looks at them and figures out how am I going to grow from this and even fewer people just put it out to the world, put it out to the next generation um, to share. So like, thank you for being no so problem. Yeah. open and honest. And so then when I wrote it the second time, I took like two weeks off and just practiced a bunch of the cases. The tough thing about rewriting day one is there's not a lot of like yeah. practice cases you can rewrite. Like no, essentially exactly. everything I had seen, I'd seen before. And there was like one or two new ones that gave me an opportunity to see. Yeah. 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 So then you just, how did you study? Did you focus on any of the technical? Because the technical is still at a core level. Like it's still, you know, some pretty in-depth technical. I did not focus on any of the technical. Like I was like, yeah, I definitely went through my like core or my booklet for some yeah. dance more a few times. Like, and then like essentially the management aspect of it, because that sometimes comes up on uh, day ones. But the main thing I was just, familiarizing myself with was was like the strategy and I was just hoping that like my ingrained knowledge from the CPA and just all the accounting course I took stuck in oh yeah absolutely and listen you already had the confirmation that you were uh competent across all levels of core uh breadth and depth uh and all of those technical six competent areas and then um you know elective level depth in your assurance competencies so of course like it would make sense so it's just, it's just kind of neat because it's like, okay, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how long it took me. And then going in there, um, how did you feel when you left? Like, did you, yeah. Oh, what, I was what... very nervous. I was like, uh, like uh, the way I came out of it was, all right, I'll write it a third time. Like I'll be better the third time. It'll be a new case. I'll have a lot more practice options. Yeah. I was very much uh, prepared for the worst. Like the first time I, uh, or the first results day I had, I was playing Phil Collins in the air tonight just because I was very confident. And I was like, oh yeah, it'll it'll come. I, like it's an easy pass. And so then the second time I was like, eh, I, like I didn't want to get my hopes up. I didn't want to be yeah. disappointed again. Like honestly not too disappointed the first time as I did pass like days two and three. Yeah. But like I was definitely like not, the most optimistic I was like better safe than sorry and putting up like shields so that I wouldn't get too disappointed both are heartbreaking but both are really relatable so based on your personal experience or just in general what advice would you have because listen we have a bunch of uh third years that are going into fourth year we have a bunch of fourth years that are going into their own CPA professional education program or Queens or uh, you have teach uh, GDIP um, or even master's programs so what advice would you have uh, for when they encounter uh, an un- unexpected bump uh, something that feels really big whether it's you know failing um, a day one or day two day three or um, an exam or, or something else that it really puts like an extra delay of six months or one year or possibly longer? Like what kind of advice would you give to those students? 
I wouldn't take it to heart. Like, essentially, um, like, some people just aren't made for writing tests, but, like, you, as I've said about interviews, like, just practice will help you get better. So even if you're writing, like, days two and three, three times, like, you can still write another three times if you get approval from the board. So, like, I wouldn't necessarily stress on the number. And, like, with each time you write, the pass rate goes up and up. So, like, you eventually you will get it. And, like, there's nothing to stress about. Like, and honestly, when I failed, like, I got the nicest messages from all the people at my firm. So it was, like, Good. they let me know, like, yeah, like, it's no big deal. Everyone ha failed. Like, it's not the end of the world. Like, we don't think any less of you. And that's completely true. Like, I was still, like, I w at the time I wrote, I be was becoming a senior. And so, like, I was senioring people who had passed the CP and they were like still coming to me with a lot of issues because I still had that experience yeah and so it's like not tests like yeah. testing can just be difficult for some people and that's not an issue like it, people don't think less of you for it completely listen and I'm really glad that you said that because I often have people in my office hours that will say various things sometimes it's like oh well I can't like I shouldn't be asking these questions. I should know this. Like, I should only be asking questions. I'm like, no, you should be asking questions if you have questions. Like, that, that, yeah. that's the, the prerequisite to questions. Or like, oh, I, and there's guilt on both sides. Like, oh, I got 90, I shouldn't ask. Or, oh, I got 50, I should know this. Or I'm like, no. And plus, what I kind of <laughs> say, and I, I say this with like love and kindness, I'm like, my favorite students aren't always the A plus students. Like, mm -hmm. I've celebrated so hard for a student that got the C plus, like, like nobody's business, because I knew, you know, somebody that comes in with a 33% on their first test that come back um, with a C plus overall, like that is a <laughs> warrior. And that is the person that I want on my team. I want the person that has a bump, brushes themselves up and is like, Hey, like, what do we do again? Cause that's relatable. Cause that's life. Life is bumpy. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. There's no clean solution. No. All right. So we talked about how you do accounting in your current gig, but I want to know what do you do for fun, Alex? Um, I would say like anything active, but like over quarantine, we couldn't really do anything active. So I was playing a lot of board games online with my friends. But since quarantine, I've picked up volleyball as well as softball. So I've been playing those like twice a week, um, each week. That's amazing. Um, and it's mm. kind of like a rec league in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. I've hurt my ankle a few times now, though, because of it. In, in the volleyball or in the softball? That was in ultimate frisbee. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Were you diving? Were you like? I was nowhere near the disc. Oh, which okay. <laughs> almost makes it worse. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Hey, just one last bit on on the thing. Um, have your university grades ever come up? Like, or, or when have they come up since you were in university? Because thinking back to that, those people that are upset with their A's or like thrilled with their C pluses or you know, props and everything can say grades don't matter, or maybe we're supposed to say grades do matter. I'm not really quite sure what the whole like thing is, but like, in your opinion, do they matter? So I wouldn't say they matter, but then again, in my interview process for like both of the jobs that I was looking for, they did ask for my university transcript. Yeah. Do so, you know, when did they ask? Was it like in the applications? Um, so the recruiter asked for it alongside my resume. So like, I think it was just so that they can give a fuller picture of like my competency before. But yeah. also I feel like being a senior accountant from a like firm, I think I would have already gotten accepted for an interview either way. Yeah. And that, that was just like a way of providing an additional distinguisher between the other candidates. Yes. No, I gotcha. So I would definitely weigh experience more than like um, grades because currently I'm doing the interviews for the like intern co-ops at my. I didn't know. Oh my gosh. Give me some, give me some dirt. Give me some details. Okay. So experience over. Okay. Yeah. So we're essentially like, we, I'm looking at the resumes too, because I want to see that they're like pursuing accounting a little bit, yeah. like, because a lot of the applicants we're getting are like more interested in finance which isn't necessarily wrong it's just like they're going to be doing a little bit of, or a decent amount of accounting so they we do want them to have a little competency there and so one of the, I think our top candidate like 
doesn't have great grades in accounting, but like they have experience from an audit firm. So I'm like, we're definitely giving them an interview just because they have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. And then just ask. And also, I don't know, it's, grades are hard because what an A might be one semester in one school mm-hmm. might be different from that same school the next semester, the next year or another school, sure. like even down the street. Yeah. And like a lot of the transcripts I'm seeing, they don't show the median grade or the mean. So like you can't really compare them to the class. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you, and it's okay if you want to say pass that this isn't um, permitted, but like we've heard from some other people that do recruiting that they'll look at things like activities or things like extracurriculars. Do those play a factor at all? Um, definitely. Like we want to make sure that the person, it would be a good like culture fit too. So we, like, I don't want to say we don't want squares, but like we, we want people who have a personality because I will, like, we will be working alongside them. So like yeah. on my resume, I always included that. Like I play Frisbee, I did diving, um, stuff like that. Yeah. I, it's hard. Cause it's like, Okay, if you have a lot of people or like people, different things show different um, elements. One is mm-hmm. like team sports show that you're able to like work and suffer like together towards a common goal. Um, yeah. And not just team sports, but like just any kind of team activities, individual pursuits, such as like diving uh, can show, you know, dedication to something um, in addition mm-hmm. to pers- like pursuing another goal. So it's like, you know, how do you use your time? And if all you're doing is focusing on how to get those A's or A pluses. It's not that that's bad, but it's that when you hit a point in your career, you can't just throw more time at something because mm-hmm. eventually there's no more time to give. Like you need to yeah. be able to integrate your knowledge. Mm-hmm, for sure. And honestly, like if I saw someone who like seemed like with a better personality and B's, like I wouldn't necessarily care. Like I think at a certain point, understanding like, I would say grades on indicate understanding. So like B's, I would say you have a good understanding. Like I wouldn't necessarily yeah. want to see A's or like not, 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 not that I want to see A's or that I don't need to see A's. I would say B's are more than sufficient for me to like see that you have an understanding or honestly like any other, like I wouldn't say grades matter too much. It's more like the personality. Yeah, and personality like we packing. definitely had like A students come in for interviews, but like they just weren't a fit so it's like there's more to uh into or more to getting a job than just grades. okay love it thank you for sharing that yeah i'm gr- grateful to have that insight okay so now that you're um at your current position and you've been here since when did you start kind of January? december december right yes i knew it was before busy season <laughs> so- yeah um so what kind of future plans or options are you considering knowing that this is going out to the internet so you know we're not expecting you to like um say how you are going to like steamroll your boss or you know blah 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 or that you're interviewing at five different competing firms right now but like what kind of things are you thinking about so honestly I'm not really thinking about like leaving anytime soon like essentially the company is growing like at an exponential rate so like We're just getting a lot more funds than we're expecting. So if anything, the team's going to be growing. And like with that, obviously there's a lot of room to move up in the company. Yeah. So like I don't see any reason to be leaving anytime soon. Yeah. That is really exciting to have um, growth opportunities within your current position. Like that's absolutely fabulous. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, um, hmm. A little bit more about how did you know when it was the right time to move from your last role? I know that, you know, understand, understanding you didn't want to do another busy season came into that, but can you maybe explain for people that have done a busy season perhaps as um, an intern or co-op student, but perhaps hasn't done in a busy season as a senior kind of, you know, how did you know when it was the right time to kind of to move on? Um essentially I like as a like this would be my second year senioring the engagements I was on and I knew like last year they weren't necessarily clean or like oh like they were clean audit opinions obviously but like the work was like very messy it took a long time like one of my clients we didn't get the general ledger until four weeks into the file so yeah that made a lot of the work very difficult and I knew like the client hasn't really changed much in the year and so 
like essentially I was just like the last out season I wasn't getting much sleep I was out some nights till like 3 a.m and I would like the mental anguish of having that coming up again just made me realize I did not want to do that again and so I was just looking um because of that I would say yeah and like to even dive down a little bit more into that it's Mm -hmm. almost sounds like your experience would be another year which would really be you wouldn't be learning or growing you would be kind of surviving and like Mm -hmm. you know and and maintaining which isn't bad for some people but you are like hey I'm not going to learn and grow um this is a lot of give without not much like take Mm -hmm. I think uh, there would have been like a few opportunities like a few new things that came up but again like in my current role I've learned so much more than I have had at and that's that's one other thing it's like okay you know when to leave is it when you're done learning or not necessarily because maybe there's just different or better learning Mm -hmm. opportunities is for me it was like the sunk cost like should I stay here because like I am going to learn or like, should I move because it'll like, I'll learn more than I have. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Listen, and sometimes there's like, not with you here, but like just in general, sometimes there's some guilt that comes along with leaving the firms at this, you know, it, there's a reason why there's, you know, a few partners and, you know, more staff, like it's a training office in a large way. And that's good because mm. we want our you know, CPAs, we want our colleagues, our CPA colleagues to have a variety of experience, whether it's in the firm or industry, but, you know, experience comes with moving around and growing and teaching and giving back. And so I Mm -hmm. I always think of like, you know, moving on is a good thing and sticking around is a good thing, but like being GT alumni is good. Mm -hmm. I would say I had no guilt leaving the firm. (laughs) Good. Um, Very much like from the way that honestly most of the firms handled COVID like just laying off staff and then like um, oh I I did not know that was that um so like I know KPMG like led the way GT let, let off some people um I'm not I don't really remember the others but I do remember yeah. like at the start of COVID a lot of the like lower or the not the best performers were let, let off but, like they were still like good employees and like honestly like some of them I worked with were like fantastic I think it was like honestly almost I wouldn't say random but like just the people they let off they didn't have the full picture of and I feel like that's a very tough thing with the firm like the year-end reviews come and like you'll have you like from what I've heard of the manager calls like they'll talk about you for like 30 seconds and they'll be like so does anyone have any like issues and like if one manager says like you had they had an issue like you'll be bumped down a rung or like a sense not like rung in terms of like promotion or level just like in terms of pay scale so like that like um, essentially how they go about that so they don't really spend too much time really digging into how you perform because they have so many staff they have to go through on those calls and it's like I would say in like they don't have the full picture of how a staff actually is it's more of just a quick snapshot you like yes no are they good should we like what's the deal with them and like they're like okay yeah that's cool like that's where they are that's how they perform like not really seeing how their work is and so it can be like essentially summarizing a person down to a few sentences yeah fair so what are your thoughts about kind of what the trend we're seeing right now is with uh, a number of companies having a lot of a lot of people quitting and they're not being able to like hire and re- retain I don't want to say comeuppance, but yeah, no, it's and like, it's interesting because yeah, go ahead. I would say it's definitely the trend that they need us more than we need them currently. So yeah. it's like if you enjoy that work, you're in a great position. Like if you're there for the long haul, like they're looking for people there for the long haul, and like also if you're like essentially there for the three, like three years to get your experience they're more than happy to have more people right now because they need more people and they're being forced to actually pay much higher salaries than they have been. I did hear that. I, so number of my students are like, Hey, I just got like a 5k bonus. Hey, I just got 3k. Hey, I just got like 
a 50% pay bump. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm like, oh my gosh, finally. Like, yeah. it's, it's so nice like, to see. I'm down to share numbers if you want. Me yeah, to go numbers. for it, please. So like, I know at GT, like intermediates, when I started, I was getting 42,000. And now uh, new, or sorry, new juniors, where I was getting a 42,000, but now juniors are coming in at like 55,000. Good. And then like intermediates are like 63,000 and then seniors like 78,000. So like much higher pay than what I was used to when I started. And I completely support that. Like 100% you should be getting paid your worth. And now firms are like being forced to actually pay the worth. Yeah, so when the merger happened in 2014-2015 for the CPACA, or sorry, CP, CGA, CMAs, and CAs for the CPA, I was sitting and having coffee with a big four uh, partner. And this is maybe a year into it or not even a year. And I was like, hey, are, are you nervous that like you'll have to pay like industry? So at that time, same thing. Uh, the junior rate, by the way, of 42 that you said, um, when I was there 15 years ago, it was like 41. So like, that's ridiculous, right? So yeah. essentially, yeah. Um, so that's less than inflation. <laughs> right? Yeah, so literally. Um, and I, <laughs> So I was like, hey, are you worried that you're actually going to have to pay? Because I had two offers, one for a firm at 40, one for industry at 60. And I, I was like, oh, um, are you nervous? And he just like, looked, and it wasn't cocky, but he was like, you know, I would have thought, yeah. And he's like, but people still like want to work here. And I was, I was like, wow, is that, is that momentum bias where people are like, you know, the CA, you know, here, like that, like, what is that? And how long is that going to last? So, um, yeah, maybe I'm not, I haven't studied it. I'm not an expert in it, but just based on talking with you and a bunch of like other people, Perhaps it's a little bit of like, how did people handle COVID? How did, how did COVID handle what workers want and value? Yeah. And also like a little bit of like, it's about like time. So it's really nice to see. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, it's funny because now I feel like, so in your role at, I want to actually just dig into this because um, yep. I, what kind of roles are you hiring for? What kind of qualifications are you looking for? And yeah, just what is that? What would their day-to-day look like? So essentially we're just replacing the, our current intern because she's finishing up her 16 month term. Um, so essentially like it's a lot of like just helping out with whatever the accounting department needs. Yeah. So like, Journal entries, account reconciliations. So not really journal entries, more just like um, tasks. So like right now we're implementing a consolidation software and she's helping with like the implementation and mapping and like wow. essentially um, we're just like help, like we're there as resources in case she has questions. So like she's had a bunch of experience now. So there's no like worries about that. No, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. No, it's, and so you're literally hiring like undergrads. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So essentially people who are going on co-ops. Cool. That's really neat. And as your company um, continues to grow and as you continue to like invest time and grow with the company, who knows, maybe in six months, a year, two years, you'll be hiring interns and uh, new CPAs and and new elements like that. So that's cool. I would bet um, on it, but I probably won't be in, involved in the process then. Oh, you never know. You never know. Fair, fair. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, I never knew this about you, so I'm interested to know. Um, are you a big like ebook listener, uh, or like audiobook listener, pardon me, or a podcaster or music, or like what do you kind of do um as far as you know, what do you listen to? What do you do? I would say I'm a big music person, but so with my new job being in Burlington, I have like an hour commute each way um, on the go train each morning. So I've been like listening to, or I've been reading the Harry Potter series. I just finished the Count of Monte Cristo. Nice. Mm -hmm. But then at work, I've been listening to a podcast actually. Oh, which one? It's a bit of a weird podcast. It's called Welcome to Night Vale. Okay. And it's essentially this radio station 
um but it's a, like it's been going the podcast started in 2012 so it's like just mm-hmm. episodes of uh, essentially a radio station about this imaginary town where all conspiracies are true and so like there'll be like don't mind the like glow storms in like the agents in black suits like they're completely normal and then like <laughs> essentially it's just this fictional radio station about a town it's very like interesting i think the episode i listened to most recently was about the faceless old woman who lives in your house but you never see so like just don't pay too much attention to her just fun stuff like that that is really neat so do they ever like involve real-time things like in their news updates or is it like 100% fiction or is it like I'm having a I would say it's 100% fiction. fiction. Okay. But like they do have real time events that like they have made up that happen. Oh my gosh. I love that. Um, One thing I love about finding old pod, like podcasts that have been around for a while, but I just found them is you have the back catalog and that's, mm-hmm. it's so lovely to be able to kind of binge and listen to several episodes in a day. For sure. It's definitely very nice. I know that I, so there's also a uh, Dungeons and Dragons podcast I listen to that nice. I like they have so much time like each episode's like four hours and they have like 500 episodes out so I have to, I've got a ways to co- catch up on that one <laughs> I love it it's always important to have goals it's all- yeah exactly <laughs> all right so this is a question that I like to ask all of my guests and I'm particularly interested in hearing this from you Alex McDonald, what is your definition of success? Um, I would say my definition of success is just being able to afford a place on my own and not have like to worry too much about money and like being able to like support a family if I wanted to. But I also don't believe that success should sur- surpass that. Like if you're at a point where you have too much money I believe like you should be forced to give back that money Mm -hmm. so very much a idea that billionaires shouldn't exist so I want that to turn on a light yeah no worries yeah it's hard it's you know for for me when I think about things it's like I think about it both from a idealistic point of view as well as like you know a selfish point of view in the sense that I selfishly don't want to see people suffer right Mm, um selfish unselfish but like and if there's a mechanism in which you know wealth distribution or wealth you know because we're not all born with the same starting line for sure so I you know um whether that's family whether that's you know, different socio, uh, cultural, or, you know, just, you know, cognitive abilities. Like I don't want, I don't want to win because somebody else didn't have a different starting point. So I I love that you pointed out that it's both um, a definition and an element, uh, a goal, but also that it's not like that more is not more. Yeah, exactly. Like it's not a competition. Like we should all, we, I believe we live in a society where like the technological advancements, like we don't need everyone to be working. It's fine for like, we should be able to have our needs met without having to like have in like people working every hour of every day just to be able to make, make ends meet. Yeah. Um, are you familiar at all with Andrew Yang? Um. I believe he's a politician in the States who is a socialist. Yeah, well, a little I, bit of a socialist. He believes in universal basic income. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where he lies between the Trump and the uh, Bernie uh, scale. <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure if he's like on the other side of Bernie or, um, but, but yeah, I, I've been really interested whenever he's on uh, a few podcasts I watch and follow. Um, I'm very interested to kind of hear him because when he talks about universal basic income, I believe he also talks about providing services. So 
So it's like, cool, you get like whatever the number is, 1,000, 1,500. But also if you need a place to live because you don't have one, you can't afford one with your work. Um, like we have housing. If you need yeah. groceries, you have groceries. Like your basic needs will be met and you will have money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes I completely agree with that. Like essentially like the means of production shouldn't be controlled by a very few. And yeah. like the profit shouldn't be controlled by a very few. Yeah. It should be yeah. evenly spread out. Yeah, I agree. And I, I wrestle with it because, you know, I do have, you know, performance-based measures um, that I do believe in and that mm -hmm. I do, I think incentives are okay. I just draw the line with like, I don't want anybody to kind of think about, can I afford to eat or turn on the lights? I don't want people to have to think about, you know, can I afford to get, you know, to have fall in hard times and not be able to get physically to their job um, and then lose their job and then, you know, lose their house and, you know, and fall into like all of that. So I, I completely agree. At the same time, I think it's some people want to go out and work and be challenged and, and contribute to society in that way. And, you know, perhaps have greater rewards. So I feel like that's okay too. Mm -hmm. I would definitely agree with that. All right, so Alex, right before I ask any final comments or anything to add, uh, if people want to get a hold of you after watching this, um, what's the best way for them to do so? I would say feel free to like reach out and like add me on LinkedIn, would yeah. probably be the best way. Check that like once a week. I'm not the most active on LinkedIn. I don't think I've ever posted anything. I'm definitely not the type to post like anything about myself, but like I use it for messaging on occasion when I want to catch up with like colleagues and stuff like that. Cool. So you're there. And if they don't yep. hear from you for a week or two, it's not like you'll never be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Alrighty. So before we wrap up, I just want to thank, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, with your energy, with your stories, with your advice. And thank you for making time for us before your big European travel adventure. Yeah. Very excited for that. Very excited. Um, you know, I won't be upset if I receive some pictures from you know, Barcelona <laughs> or Amsterdam. So feel free to send those through. Uh, Perfect. Alex McDonald, any final comments or anything else to add? Um, I don't have too many final comments. I would just like to say that your class was one of my favorite accounting classes. Honestly, all the accounting props were great. And I would say that all the students should definitely be looking forward, if they're still happening, to the end of uh, fourth year uh, drink nights with the prof. That was definitely one of the funner experiences I had from university. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that this year, just with the current regulations mm. at the university and not knowing where the gray area that we, that we walk into, but yeah. I, I hope, I hope, hope, hope we're able to do that in 2023. And then all the grads are welcome, right? All For the sure. grads from all the years. And, um, I'm, I'm glad that that still is a fond memory um, for you because it was absolutely for me as well. So thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thanks for having me, Sam. <laughs>